Chapter Twenty Six of Women of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Women of History by Anonymous. Chapter Twenty Six. Jane Shore, fourteen sixty, Hume. This lady was born of reputable parents in London, was well educated, and married to a substantial citizen. But, unhappily, views of interest more than the maid's inclinations had been consulted in the match, and her mind, though framed for virtue, had proved unable to resist the allurements of Edward V, who solicited her favours. But while seduced from her duty by this gay and amorous monarch, she still made herself respectable by her other virtues, and the ascendant which her charms and vivacity long maintained over him, was all employed in acts of beneficence and humanity. She was still forward to oppose calumny, to protect the oppressed, to relieve the indigent, and her good offices, the genuine dictates of her heart, never waited the solicitations of presence or the hopes of reciprocal services but she lived not only to feel the bitterness of shame imposed on her by this tyrant but to experience in old age and poverty the ingratitude of those courtiers who had long solicited her friendship and been protected by her credit no one among the great multitudes whom she had obliged had the humanity to bring her consolation or relief she languished out her life in solitude and indigence and amidst a court inured to the most atrocious crimes, the frailties of this woman justified all violations of friendship toward her, and all neglect of former obligations. Such is the picture of Jane Shore. Her misfortunes were partly due to the cruelty of the protector Gloucester, the same author says. The protector asked the council what punishment those deserve that had plotted against his life, who was so nearly related to the king, and was entrusted with the administration of government. Hastings replied that they merited the punishment of traitors. These traitors, cried the protector, are the sorceress, my brother's wife, and Jane Shore, his mistress, with others their associates. See to what a condition they have reduced me by their incantations and witchcraft, upon which he laid bare his arm, all shriveled and decayed. But the counsellors, who knew that this infirmity had attended him from his birth, looked on each other with amazement, and above all Lord Hastings, who, as he had since Edward's death, engaged in an intrigue with Jane Shore, was naturally anxious concerning the issue of these extraordinary proceedings. Certainly, my lord, said he, if they be guilty of their crimes, they deserve the severest punishment. And do you reply to me, exclaimed the protector, with your ifs and your ands? You are the chief abettor of that witch, sure. You are yourself a traitor, and I swear by St. Paul that I will not die before your head be brought me. He struck the table with his hand. Armed men rushed in. The counsellors were thrown into the utmost confusion. Hastings was seized and hurried away, and hastily beheaded on a timber log which lay in the court of the tower. Two hours after a proclamation, well penned and fairly written, was read to the citizens of London, enumerating his offences and apologizing to them from the suddenness of the discovery for the sudden execution of that nobleman, who was very popular among them but the saying of a merchant was much talked of on the occasion, who remarked that the proclamation was certainly drawn from the spirit of prophecy, and the protector, in order to carry on the farce of his accusation, ordered the goods of Jane Shore to be seized, and he summoned her to answer before the council for sorcery and witchcraft, but as no proofs that could be received, even in that ignorant age, were produced against her, he directed her to be tried in the spiritual court for her adulteries and lewdness, and she did penance in a white sheet at St. Paul's before the whole people. End of chapter 26